Welcome into the Cam and Strick podcast, episode number 48. Damn. Cam? Damn, dude. How you feeling today? Uh, yeah, I'm all right. Mondays suck. Are you nervous? Are you sweating? For Lou? Well, we'll talk about that later. Well, that, that's what? not why I ask. I'm just curious if you're nervous. Usually you Am get I a nervous? little nervous around this time. Why would I be nervous? Why would I be nervous? What, to sit next to you? <laughs> no, I'm good, man. I'm all good. How was your weekend? It was actually very uneventful. I cleaned my fucking basement out, and I'm like, oh, what am I doing? Kate's like, can you clean this part? I'm like, clean? I, I don't even know how to clean. I'm not good at cleaning anything. I'm like a walking tornado when I walk through my house. Are, you, like, a, are you a mess? You keep things no, tidy? No, I'm pretty organized. I just, you know, when I got to clean shit, I'm not good at it. You know, when I got to do lawn shit, I'm not good at it. When I got to do anything, I'm pretty much not good at it. So it's like, Kate's like, can we clean this because we're selling the house? I'm like, oh, I got to scrub? Scrub this? What do I do? You, well, you put bleach down and we got, I'm like, what? Wait, what's going on? Oh, I got to get on my, no. See, I'm not good at it. Mm. And I don't like doing it. Are you handy? Hell no. Handy? <laughs> When would I ever be handy? I've never dug a ditch in my life. I've never done anything like that. I had to dig a ditch for the first time a okay. year ago. Digging ditches. I'm talking about like building things. Fuck if you have no. to fix something. Fuck, dude, I'm so irrelevant in so many ways. Don't Now you're making me depressed. I, I, I can't do shit around the house. Mm. I got to go next door and get my dad to do things. I have Kate do things. I'll hire people to do things. I suck in a lot of ways, to be completely honest with you. You find anything good in your basement when you're cleaning stuff out? Uh, a couple things. What'd you find? So you know what I do? I find things. <laughs> I put them in my garage. I open my garage door up, and all the neighbors start coming That's over. so weird I to know. me. Who do you I live know. next to? A bunch of scavengers or what? Yeah, no, they just... They just I, yeah, I guess so. I mean, the garage opens for Cam, and, and everyone come. runs out of their house yeah. and just wants a bunch yeah. of free That's shit. That's what happens when you live in a blue-collar neighborhood in Eureka. Is that what you call it? Yeah, it's a blue-collar neighborhood in Eureka. Tell me about your neighbors. What are they like? Well, my parents are, you know, they created me. Okay, so someone asked me the other day, because they've listened to the podcast, mm -hmm. so they said, wait, I'm confused. Cam talks about his parents, like, walking over to the house. They live right next door to you, correct? So when I was 18, uh -huh. the devil signed me for okay. a couple hundred grand. Yeah. My neighbors moved out right at the time. I'm having people. What my, was your signing bonus? Two fifty. Okay, like two, right off the bat, they right just give you two right there, right when I while signed, you're right still playing I, junior. Yes, right when I was drafted, mm -hmm. they signed me a week later. Right when I get got back to training camp, couple so maybe a month later. Right when I got to training camp, I signed. I remember it. Took the boys out. Oh my god! And then my I got home that summer, and my neighbors right next door moved out, wanted to sell their house, and I, I jumped on it, and I bought it. And I still have it today, so I just walk next door to my parents every single day, steal their shit, do whatever the fuck I want, steal their food, and uh, and I, I love it. Take the dog next door. You know, they walk the dog for me and stuff. Like, it's it's just, it's it's nice. My, look, look. Hold my, on. Let me ask you this, though. Yeah. So you had your house, and then the the, the, the neighbor house became available so no, you, I was, you snatched I was, that up. I was living with my parents in this small little house when I was 18 still so you live in the parent the house that you grew up in no my no, no I didn't I didn't live in the same fucking house my whole life I moved a bunch of houses but once we had a downscale because my parents were fucking broke because of me mm -hmm. we moved in this blue collar neighborhood in, in Eureka Missouri it was tight it was small and I lived there till I was 18 and I signed the contract and I moved right next door so my parents could take care of it when I'm in I Jersey see. so your parents are in their original house and you for, moved for next last door twenty to years, yeah. Okay, yeah. For I got gotcha. you. Years. I got gotcha. you. I yeah, got gotcha. you. Yeah. And so, what's that like? I mean, you like living next door oh, to your parents. Okay. So what about Kate? Everybody, I mean, they, everybody gets along oh, or what? Hell yeah, they love Kate. Kate's a fucking angel. Well, because you can understand this. Most people probably no, wouldn't, they hate me more than anything. Live right next door to family. Like what that. are they gonna do? They gonna come in my house? I'll lock the fucking door. <laughs> what are they gonna do? They've seen everything from me, dude. All right, I, I got to talk to you about a couple things. First off, with the NHL looking to come back yeah. and play. I've said this a few times here in the podcast. I'll say it again. I've always gotten the impression talking to players, uh, not just here in St. Louis, players that play elsewhere. Yeah. You know, players, people ask all the time, do they want to come back and play? No. I don't get the sense after talking to anybody that they really want to come back to play. Hockey this summer, okay? I mean, hockey players are conditioned to take the summers off. Yeah. They're playing golf every day. This is what they're doing. Now, all of a sudden, you know, if we were going to talk about, you know, the season returning back in May or something like that, which was some early speculation at the beginning of quarantine, maybe they can come back in May or June. Now we're stretching that all the way into August, potentially even later than that. July for training camp. Um, Damn, dude. Listen, players are back on the ice. They're skating now. And 
NHL players, you know, once they start skating, getting back into the routine, they can get their game back in order to come back and play, okay? But do they want to come back and play? I think that's a completely different scenario. I think uh, NHL players understand financially it's in their best interest to come back and play. Moving forward, for the league, how much percentage of their paycheck needs to, you know, go towards escrow. Escrow stuff, yeah. Um, which impacts the salary cap, all that type of stuff, okay, is is something that obviously comes into play. So do NHL players want to play, or do they realize they probably have to play? But at the end of the day, I don't think it necessarily means that we're guaranteed to see hockey. I hope we do, but I don't think it's a slam dunk camp. It's like, why not just wait? Why not just wait? Well, if I'm a player, though, and I'm like, okay, it's like living in Sweden – I said this before. It's like leaving in Sweden or Alaska and playing in the summer like that, where it's like if you're living up there and it's sunny all day long or dark all day long, it fucks you up. Like this, they're not in that crazy, uh, you know, all day, every day hockey, hockey, hockey mode because they're in the summertime, man. It's it's different. Like your clock, your mental clock is not right, and that's actually a big deal. So, to answer your question, if that was a question, if I'm a player, I'm probably like fuck this. I gotta go to fucking. I gotta go sit for two months, maybe oh, well, just a week. But for and then you know, sit in a hotel that mm-hmm. we don't know what kind. What, what do I get to do? Do I sit around all day? The question do I have to is, wear a fucking mask. Are there enough players that think that way to truly impact the decision, the overall outcome of a decision from the NHL? That's PA. a good call. I, I think that they think that way, but I also think that, like you said, they're like, no, let's just suck it up and do it. Mm-hmm. But do I think they want to? Do I think their families want them to? Probably not. Do you think if the NBA, because now we're starting to hear about players yeah. in the NBA, and, and for whatever reason, there's all different types of reasons as to why NBA players may not want to come back and play this summer. But if the NBA doesn't return, do you think that impacts what the NHL does? Um, I think it would be beneficial for the NHL to play if the uh, NBA's not there. I would agree I with mean, that. I mean, come on. Come on now. So, like, again, the players – do, do you want in the middle of summer when you're barely training? And look, again, if you're a professional athlete and you're in a city and you can't find ice, you're fucking lazy. Mm-hmm. What do I mean by that? Hey, you walk in any fucking rink and you're a pro athlete, they're going to give you ice. I don't give a shit who you are. You're an NHL. I was told players in Vegas were skating like over two months ago. Probably. Like several okay. weeks ago. Whatever the, the number here. of months. I don't know if it was two months. Whatever. Several weeks ago, long before... You know, the last couple of weeks when we learned about, you know, NHL players skating all and, over and the Andy, country. You think... That these people that run in these rinks, honestly, and I'm not talking for everybody, mm-hmm. but most of them, mm-hmm. when you got five NHL guys living in the city, no, you can't come, skate. You can't skate. Oh, you <laughs> social distance out right. there, you, you fuck off. Right. No, I'm fucking battle right. drill and shit. There's millions of dollars online. COVID, yeah, I should worry about a little bit. Yeah. But I was worried two months ago. Now I'm kind of like, fuck this. Let's get on with our lives. And don't confuse what I'm saying as to me saying that I don't want the NHL to return this summer. I hope of they course, do. Course, yeah. I, I want I'm NHL so, so. hockey. Yes. I'm just trying to keep it real. And yeah. and this is what, you know, the vibe and the, the feedback that I'm getting from. There's still a lot of questions that want to be answered. Guys don't want to leave their families, all that type of stuff. We've heard that. They but might now, still be scared of COVID, But now too. you've got Roman Polak, you know, who we both know very well. Yeah, great guy. Huge I, hog. I talked to uh, – you want to talk about that or no? Oh, it sniffed a drain in the shower, but okay. go ahead. Okay. Um, Roman Polak told me last season that he would not return this season. Now, he did come back and play. But I think he already had it in his mind that his days were numbered in the National Hockey League. There's a, a professional team in his hometown of the Czech Republic where he can just stay there, make be a, a hero, a make some good coin. Yeah. Not NHL coin, but still some real good money. Not 2.5, but He's half. like, I don't have any bills to pay. My house is paid off. I've got nothing. He's what? got 20 in the bank. Exactly. So whatever, else, whatever he has. But, Andy, but why the fuck not? Go over there and suck it up for two months and try to win a fucking cup. Even if it's a well, goofy cup, win the goddamn thing. I look at it two different ways. First off, you're kind of letting your team down if you come back and play this year and you don't come back. Like, he's a big part of their defensive core. But he also said, at my age, I can't just skate for three weeks and then get back to playing intense hockey. I need two months to skate and to train at my age to come back and play. Guys who are 25, who are 22, 23, 24, they can do it. But for me, what is he, 34 years old yeah, now? dude, he's up there. Something like that, 34 or 35? Yeah. He's like, I can't just come back and skate for a couple weeks. That's insane. As a D-man, as a, as a big, bulky defenseman, mm-hmm. your hips, your timing, man, for me, like, I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it at all. I need, I start skating in fucking May, dude. I start kind of getting my groove on, doing mm-hmm. this or that. And then by the time you're there, I'm like, okay, I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. And you don't even need to skate. 
I mean, Roman's home playing 20 minutes a night. Yeah, well, I say, everybody needs to skate. What, am I going to walk around? <laughs> oh, fucking idiot. But I, I know, but for a guy like that, man, it's tough. And, and you're a D-man. Like, you need, there's so much more to training than just like, oh, I'm going to go out there and fuck around. Some guys can do that, but right. most guys can't. So I think it's something to pay attention to. I yeah. guarantee you he's not the only one who feels that way Dude, who's, who's you, over man. in Europe right now. I, oh, I get to fly back in a, right. in a commercial right. flight plane, go over there, get all my stuff, right. only have a few pack uh, bags, all my shit's back home. Risk corona. Risk Corona. I think I, I don't think guys are too worried about that now. Some are. Well, some are. And if man. you are, I don't blame you. They're no different than society. I was than a, society. I, some people are concerned about it's it. It's half and half. Like right now, I'm like, ah, do I? I'm just not there anymore. I was, but not anymore. But Dude, I don't know. I was hardcore. I don't have there. kids either. By the I way, I mean, I was wearing like gloves. Oh yeah, you were a fucking bubble boy. Oh my god, I don't blame you. And and you know what? But I've kind of listen. I feel like I was the first case anyway. In the United States, several months ago, I was the first person oh, yeah, in the country yeah. to get your corona. patient zero. No, oh, I was the fuck. first. I was the first case. I had it before anybody else, so I think I had those antibodies. That do they protect you? Yes, no. You don't have any antibodies. I'll tell you that. You Looking at you right now, <laughs> but I do. I, I do think families are wives are, you know, talking to the guys, the husbands, and, and some of the players say, uh, really. Really, but again, if you're a player and you have a chance to win the Stanley Cup, mm-hmm. you do it and you suck it up for two months. And I also will say this: the NHL will set that up like and make the Tampa it fucking Bay Lightning. Nice. I think the yeah, Lightning look bad. Down. They I'm look terrible. Thank you. You Thank lost you. in the first round last year there after having is. one of the best seasons Thank in the history of the National Hockey League, and you're one of two teams that don't want to do it now. Carolina, we run the Carolina Hurricanes. Cam and I do. We don't, well, we we're we, part owner. Well, now. We, and we are, yeah. and we we run the Hurricanes. Let's ask Tom. Tom Dundon. Mm-hmm. Just talk to him. He'll tell you. Yep. He wants to know what we need, what we think about the organization, how we can fix the organization. Yeah. What did we tell Tom Dundon when we first asked him to come on the podcast? When we said, Tom, come on the podcast, he said, I stopped doing interviews once we became relevant. What did we say? You ain't relevant. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we did. You're not relevant. Yes, oh, we did. Oh, look, acting like a bowling pin at the end of a game ain't relevant, Tommy. You're not relevant. You're not relevant. Come on Not now. yet. Not yet. We're going to get you there. We'll get you there. We're going to get you there. Bowling pin. So we're all in this together, for sure, with the Carolina oh, Hurricanes. Oh, but, um, you know, what else was I saying? Yeah, it's just, it's just a weird situation. I think it's going to be half and half. And I think. I, oh, Tampa Bay. Tampa, Tampa yeah. Bay. Come on now. They should be like, hell yeah, we want to come back and oh, play. Your fans. We're going to win the Stanley Cup. That embarrassing fucking year. And I was told by people yeah. very close to the Tampa Bay Lightning, okay? Weeks before the vote was taken where they were one of two teams with Carolina to say, no, we don't want to return to play, that they don't want to play. And I, I couldn't quite – now, I know they're what making was, excuse. Why? What was their excuse well, for it? Well, they, we don't like the format. Listen, no, no, no. They didn't – you either want to play or you don't want to play. You didn't like the format. Who gives a fuck about the format? If you're bitching about Corona and you're mm-hmm. scared of that, fine. We'll give you that. You don't like the format? Then come up with something yourself then. I will say this about Jesus. St. Louis. If they play – they're going to try to win this whole damn God thing. God damn right they are. And they're going to be like determined to win. And they're going to win. party like rock stars and, 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 and they're going to celebrate and it's still going to be a Stanley Cup. Yeah, no, like if they're going it's out there, gonna, they're going out there to win. And the advantage the Blues have over every other team, and I've said this several times, it's just the two-headed monster, the combination of Craig Berube and Doug Armstrong. Like the players have no choice but to be mentally and physically ready to go out there and dominate and win and play. And if they have a training camp, believe me, in addition to the rest of the coaches, the core of the group, you know, of the Blues in terms of the leadership they have, like the veterans they have, yeah. those guys will be in it to win it. Oh, yeah, man. They know what it feels like. They're smelling the blood and the water and like, we could do this. We'll suck it up for two months. We'll get two and a half months off. We'll regroup when we need to. But two months. It's set, you, you gotta, and when you're an athlete like that, man, sometimes you just you got to just put something in your head and say, just go for two months. I don't care how hard it's going to be. Just suck it up. And teams that get along with each other really well, yep. that like genuinely are genuine. 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 It's, he's not a rapper. <laughs> they're, they're not rappers. Uh, the, guys that, the guys that like each other, they're going to be like, okay, let's go hang out in Vegas for a couple Why months. Why not? Let's go to Vegas and chill. Now, again, right. there's two sides to everything. And we, we, we just said we're, we're kind of – I'm kind of me, – me personally contradicting myself because I'm like, why would they want to do that? But on the other hand, because there's two sides of the story. It's so goddamn bizarre to where – I'm telling you, you one, my, one part of your brain's like, let's go to Vegas, let's do our thing, da-da-da-da. The other part of your brain's like, I got to – where am I going? I got to go to Vegas, sit in a, 
apartment or a hotel and do I get to golf? Am I stuck there? I can't see my family and we're not playing in front of fans when we could just wait another month and a half and start the season regular on a regular basis and go have a full season and just have this be a fucking wash? I don't know. I don't know. Every time we kind of go back and forth, I'm like leaning on one side and like we talk about more and I'm leaning on the other side. So I can only imagine what the players are thinking. Yeah, I know, man. So, so. it's weird. It's just weird. That's the bottom line. It's All right, Gary weird. Roberts on this edition of the yeah. Cam and Strick podcast, episode number 48. Now, let me just tell people this. You know, we've been wanting to get this guy on because he is the he's the trainer to the stars yeah. in the National Hockey League. Plus, he played over 1,200 games. He won a Stanley Cup, scored 50 goals. Anybody who's followed the NHL over the course of the last couple of decades, he's a household name. This guy was a hell of a hockey player, really good player. And what he's done in his post-career, you know, when you're getting the attention of, like, the Stamkoses and the Connor McDavid's, the Matthew Kachuk's, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Brady Kachuk, all these guys that have been working out with him and swear by this guy. I was like, we got to get this guy on. When I called him, Cam, he was like, yeah, other podcasts, man. They've been trying to reach out to me and whatever. I don't really do these. Yeah. And we talked, whatever, and he agreed to come on and do it. But you'll notice during the course of this interview, it wasn't the easiest for him to get through. Talking about the training and the impact he has on current players. And he fucking facility, cried. His, Andy, his, fucking his cried. facility in Toronto. I'll say. That's the easy part. But when you're getting into what this guy went through as a player – to have to retire at the age of 30 and then come back and play for 12 or 13 years when doctors were saying, hey, there's no chance you can come yep. back and play. Too big of a risk. And he talks about Jim Rutherford, the general manager now in Pittsburgh, who was the former GM in Carolina who took a chance on him, man. And just thinking about where his life was at, it got really, really it emotional. Did. We didn't. Did. I, I thought that his phone fucked up. Yeah, we didn't know. I didn't know it, but he he was like, I haven't talked about this before. Mm -hmm. So you guys are going to see, that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what we hey, do. Well, I mean, we don't try to make you cry. I, I don't but try you know to make, what? Andy did it. But yeah, great guy, leader, did his thing, won a Stanley Cup in 89, pretty much done it all. And now he's training guys, and he's like the biggest warrior trainer off ice, like hardcore stuff, something that probably you would need, Andy. Something that you would probably need, get them traps a little bigger, get them traps a little bigger, maybe that neck a little bigger. I'd call Gary Roberts. So it probably only cost you like thirteen grand a month. All right, this is going to be a uh, a great conversation with with Gary Roberts, man. Uh, and he belongs in the Hall of Fame too. We talk about yeah, that. That's right. I think he should he be does. in there. If he can't go in as a player, he should go in as a builder. Okay. You Maybe you'll go in as a builder one day, Cam. <laughs> Bob the Builder. Okay. Cam Jansen will go in. <laughs> I'll make the uh, introductory speech. All right. Car Shield. Get your coverage today. Your car gets messed up, something bad happens, you don't have thousands of dollars in the bank to pay for it, get yourself protected, get the protection you need, doesn't even cost you a lot of money, Not Cam. Not much at all, man. Not much at all. I mean, and it takes you like a minute or two to even sign up, Simple. and these guys are great people, man. They support the game, they love the game of hockey, too. Support our sponsors, 800-857-2481. Again, 800-857-2481. Mention the promo code CAM, and you'll save 10%. Yeah, baby. C-A-M. C-A-M. Is it C-A-M? Yeah, that's what yeah. it is. C-A-M. Yeah. yeah, that's my name. And you'll save 10%. How about that? It's easy. Simple. You know, you can even pick out your own rental car. You can decide where you want to have your car taken, who wants to work on it and whatever. They hook you up with a rental car. It's just an easy thing to yes. have. Like, it just makes yes. every it makes your life that much more simple, yeah. if that makes sense. No. It's okay. just, it simplifies everything. Yes. Awesome. Car Promo code CAM. Save yourself 10%. Also... Our friends over there at Ga uh, GadgetBuyback.com. Oh, baby. I mean, Cam, I dropped my phone yesterday. Look at that. Oh, you're a Hoosier now. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, know, it's bad. fix that, it's dude. Bad. You look like a hillbilly. David Long, I'm calling you today. Holy, and he's a better hockey player than you. Why no. do you do, dude, fix that damn thing. You're representing the podcast yeah, now. Yeah. Well, I dropped Seriously. it yesterday. It's Monday. Dude, nice hands. Like, figure it out. Okay. At least I drop kick my phone and it doesn't even break. My phone's a lot tougher. So than yours. when you when out. you have this situation like I have, then you call eight seven 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 two eight 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 zero, and get yourself set up. If you're in St. Louis, they have a store in Oakville. They're going to have lots more stores. They coming. are. They're building. I mean, a, bunch a lot of more stores. But if you're out of St. Louis, anywhere in the world right now, or if you're a company, we have listeners in Africa. Did you know that? Really? Oh yeah. Africa, yeah, I was pretty big over in Africa. Ireland. When I was young. Scotland. Well, it's amazing. Let's figure People that are all over. Figure the, figure the they are Great all Britain. Over the place. It ain't because of you. Asia, that might be because of you. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. The gadget buyback. 
Honestly, if you're a company though, and you have all these computers that you give to your employees and yes. stuff like that, and phones, phones, watches, whatever, anything, anything, yeah. you could take those old technology that mm-hmm. slows down your company, yeah. and they'll buy them off you, get them off your hands. You need to regroup, and you have to Dude, do it every couple of years, man. It's that it is simple. It is. Very so simple. Gadgetbuyback.com. There's another website as well. Gadgetlabmobile.com. Gadgetlabmobile.com or gadgetbuyback.com. Turn in your own old phones. Don't be stuck with an old phone, especially a phone that has a crack on it. Embar- you're embarrassing me right now. And when you you're take when you take it right to now. the store, by the way, if you're here locally in St. Louis, dude, they fix it while you wait in no time. I'm, I'm, I know, yeah, dude. If you walk around and you have a phone that's cracked, yeah. like it, it's, dude, you, you you bump down a level in society. The in my script opinion. that they gave me that we've never read on the air, at least you can't read, so you're not reading this. Uh, did you Heart break your phone this weekend and need to get it? Yes, I did. Yes, I did break my phone this weekend. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you did. Yeah, you <laughs> yes, did. I did. Yes, I did. Yeah. 877-772-8880. Also, Bellman.com. Get yourself a new ride. The Cadillac, the Buick, the GMC. Right across the street, you got the Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram. Right damn, there in damn, Troy, damn. Missouri. Say what up to our boy, Dan Bellman. Again, loves the game. That's the Huge common denominator, guy. man, with all our, hockey, hockey, with all our sponsors. They all love hockey. Yeah, they're easy. And again... The Bellman Automotive, when you walk in there, your wife could go in there. Mm-hmm. Like, there's not much of dudes creeping you out, coming 20 fucking dudes. Hey, hey. No, it's it's. What'd you clean. call them before? Swinging, 10 swinging dicks coming, swinging their dick around. Like, who's this young lady coming in here? No, yeah. not there. Not there. Your wife can go buy a car. Mm-hmm. You can go in there. You yeah. feel comfortable. Not ripping you off. It's like an no. easy feel. Com- like, I like that. And they've been in the game for a long time. They know yeah. what they're doing, man. And they're going to hook you up with the best deal possible. Hook yourself up with a new Jeep. I got a Cadillac. Escalade that's on order. Looking forward uh, to that, to getting that new car. Uh, Dan Bellman, B-E-H-L-M-A-N-N.com. B-E-H-L-M-A-N-N.com. Hook it up. Bellman.com in Troy, Missouri. All right. Gary Roberts, man. This guy uh, is an interview you're going to want to sit back and relax, pop open a, uh, a cold one, and just chill. And listen to one of the biggest and most impactful people who are impacting the game today damn right gary roberts on the cam strict podcast what is on the agenda today you're at the rink or are you at the facility what are you doing today gary roberts well we uh we have been okay to skate and uh on the ice here in ontario with four four players and one uh, coach or one goalie so that's what i was doing today managing uh Managing all the waivers that have to be signed, managing oh, all the Ugh. all the uh, administrative work that has to be done in order to get guys on the ice and try to get them back ready to play hockey. Wow. You have any room left at your facility? We, we may come and hang out for the summer and just do a little workout well, with you, Gary. As long as Cam's nicer than he was when he played, he's about more than welcome to come in. <laughs> I told him you said that, and I was going to bring the two of you together. <laughs> What was his problem, Gary? I'm surprised you didn't take care of this on the ice here. What's going on? What did he do to I you? Wasn't, I wasn't. I wasn't that silly to want to take care of it on the ice, but <laughs> you know. Now you could. You work out every day. Uh, I had a lot of well, frustration. <laughs> I don't know. I was limping around the gym today with a bad hip, so I don't think I'm taking anybody out these days, guys. I'm just. Uh, I'm a lover now, not a fighter. Yeah, me too. Uh, we, yeah, <laughs> you know that. How is your body, by the way, man? You had went through some nasty injuries. Like, are you feeling okay now? Because it's hard to keep up with the young guys. Even, even trying to train them is tough, tough on your body, isn't it? Yeah, and, I, and I'm fortunate, guys. Like, I've I'm spending less time in the gym. Um, uh, I have a, you know, a head strength conditioning coach that I've hired that takes care of a lot of the the work inside the gym. Um, I'm in the gym, but not doing any of the heavy lifting. Any demonstration that I do for younger players now is usually done with a, with some type of a tool, whether it's a hockey stick or something else. Uh, I still think I'm fairly fit, but I'm not in the position, as you know, when you're a strength coach and you're in the gym and you're lifting yeah. weights and you're moving stuff around and you're demonstrating exercises. Yep. Um, there's some things I can demonstrate and my coaches know, and there's some things I can't. Um, these kids are elite athletes and and, uh, and amazing lifters. Uh, a lot of the pro guys. So so you need to have a guy. So my my head strength and conditioning coach is an is an ex MMA fighter. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's he's thirty. He just turned thirty last week. His name's Adrian Balaka, and he does an amazing job for us. And he's young enough that he can still 
um, demonstrate, uh, compete, and, uh, and train with the guys when necessary. So, so I feel comfortable that I've kind of passed the reins on to him to do most of the in-gym uh, training. And then I kind of manage, uh, you know, I manage 100 players coming into the facility and, and jump in to the gym when, when I need to be in there for, for certain situations. So what do you? So did you specifically find? Like, do you look at the MMA guys? Let me try to set this question up. Do you look at the MMA guys and say, "Wow, okay, like you guys are athletes. You know how to work out in different situations. Everybody who does MMA is completely different with their styles and stuff." So how did you pick this guy up? Was it specifically something that has to do with him training in in MMA throughout his career, or how did you how did you find this guy? Yeah. So actually, Lauren Goldenberg, who was a strength coach uh, in St. Louis for Jacques Martin. Mm. Uh, he was a strength coach for the Ottawa 67s. He was a strength coach for the Ottawa Senators, Florida Panthers, Quebec Nordiques. Uh, Lauren was my longtime strength coach, still a great friend today. Talked to him often. Um, and he was training Adrian uh, Velaka. Adrian was interning under him when Lauren was in, back in Ottawa almost eight years ago. Wow. So Adrian was competing, fighting, and and wanted to be a strength coach. So he kind of was uh, training with Lauren in Ottawa, and then I was starting to expand my business after I retired, and asked Lauren, you know, I, need, I could use a really good young strength coach to to come in and start working with us, and kind of had that vision that you know it's something I want to do for sure. It's my passion. You know, preparation became my passion. But I knew at some point I was going to have to hand the in gym reins over to somebody else. Yeah, and I needed to find a young guy. And my whole thing when I when I came back to play, and then my my last two teams, right, were were Pittsburgh and Tampa. And I had an opportunity to to play with Sidney Crosby for a couple of years, and then finish my career playing on the line with Steven Stamkos. I saw the athleticism and the and the the skill, the gift that those two players had, and and the dynamic that they had off the ice. And that's when I realized at that point, like the game was changing, the yeah. athleticism. And, and listen, I hate to compare when we played Cam and, you know, the 80s and the oh, 90s. Yeah. I hate to compare that because I, I feel like I always take away from those players. Those players were amazing. Some of the best players that have ever played the game played during that era, those eras. But the game was changing in a, in a way that, speed was be, going to become more of a factor agility was going to become more of a factor and truthfully you know overall athleticism was was going to become a bigger factor so that's when i started hiring strength coaches that weren't necessarily in hockey uh you know my my head speed coach is a soccer player my head strength coach is an mma fighter um, Dougie Davidson, who who, who was uh, was in Vegas, he was in Pittsburgh. He was a rugby player, and he was my guy that I brought to those teams when I when I worked for those teams. And, and so now Dougie's the head strength and conditioning coach in Vegas. Well, he was a rugby player. Mm. So my whole vision was I needed to find people that understood under, understood uh, something other than than just hockey training. And, mm. and I, my, my goal is, is to build better athletes, not necessarily better hockey players. Yeah. Not, you know, obviously, right, athleticism, I believe if you become a better athlete on the ground, mm-hmm. you become a better hockey You be, Overall, you become a better hockey exactly. player. Yeah, and now more, exactly. more athletes are starting to play hockey too. So it's like, you know, back mm-hmm. in the day, I think a lot of hockey players maybe focused on just hockey. You're they seeing can. now guys grow up, Hey, they want to be football, basketball players. They get introduced to hockey. They start doing that. And so they bring, you know, maybe a different mentality and maybe a different level of athleticism, what you're talking about. You know, uh, some of our listeners may not know. I mean, you're pretty much the trainer to the stars in the National Hockey League. But but what's the selling point? Because there is so much competition. Is it the fact that you played over 1,200 games? Is it the fact that you trained some of the bigger names in the National Hockey League? What are you telling an NHL player or maybe even a, a junior player who wants to come work with you, why they should work with you, Gary? Well, I think it's, you know, for, for me, and this is why this has been such a strange time for my business, I believe to have the biggest impact on young players, they need to see it live. 
You know, they, I've never been a big fan of sending people programs. Mm-hmm. I like, and, and I worked for Joe Noondike with the Dallas stars. And I remember saying to him after I went, spent one year or something like Joe, you're sending me to Miami of Ohio to spend the weekend with, with uh, Riley Smith or to watch Riley Smith play and try to have a breakfast with Riley Smith to, to truly try to get him to understand the, the, the full package, the full, you know, fueling, training, and recovery package that I sell. It's, it's a lifestyle that I sell. It's not a training program. And it, for, for to accomplish that over a weekend with a college player, I just felt like it was lost. I was spending three, four days on the road to spend a couple hours with a player and in my eyes, not accomplishing very much. Yeah. So, so I always felt like I needed a player to see it. I need a player to come to my facility and see what I do every day and see what we do and the way that we train. And when you've got guys like Nick David and Stamkos, like when you have those guys that come to the gym every day and they just want to get better for young players, For young players to see that, I believe they need, you know, to, to, to understand it, they need to see it. And and uh, and that's why the in-person thing has been what we've sold. And when players come and see it, they go, okay, I got it now, yep. right? And, it, and that's why this time's been so tough for me because I've had to expand my business online. And it's not, it's not really my, you know, I'm 54 years old. You guys know, like, uh, all the... Uh, you know, the, the technical side of, of sending programming and making sure, like, you know, I live in Uxbridge, Ontario, guys. I'm an hour outside Toronto. If I have a Wi-Fi signal to, to make it through this call with you guys and, and, and reception on my phone to make it through this call with this guys, I'd, I'd be, I'd be, I'll be happy if we can last for 40 minutes, <laughs> right? And I, I'm sending videos across the world of, of, of programming and exercises, and you can imagine the frustration I've had over the last uh, few months trying to do that for players that are stuck in places that they don't have very much to train. Hmm. So what are you, you finding know? as the common denominator? I mean, you mentioned McDavid, and from what I understand, he started training or coming to your facility as a young kid long before you know, hockey fans, at least in the National Hockey League, knew who he was. Uh, I mean, are these guys athletic freaks? I mean, the, the, the guys that truly are at the, at the cream of the crop in terms of the best players in the world, what are you seeing in terms of the trends with them as athletes? I would say, um, you know, attitude, as we all know, right? Like, you know, attitude, work ethic competitiveness like those players like they're great players because they've they've obviously have you know they have a a god-given skill that they've been given guys but you know that's not fair to say that's why they're great hockey players so these guys uh i believe we got to them when they were young Uh, they truly bought into the lifestyle Mm -hmm. package of our program and it's what you you do away from the gym and the rink that become more important than actually what you do at the rink, if you know what I mean. Mm-hmm. I do. There's no right? it, it's the lifestyle. It's what you do when you're by yourself as a pro athlete, as a as a as a player playing a team sport. It's easy to motivate yourself to do the work when you're with a group of guys. But when you're by yourself, are you disciplined enough each and every day to follow the, those guidelines that we give you? When we're not with you, how do you live your life? And that is my biggest thing. And that's what I learned to do at 30, to come back and play 13 years on the National Hockey League. I learned to be disciplined away from the group. Yeah. And it's uh, and, and there's a lot of sacrifices, and you know this, guys. You have to be willing to sacrifice a lot of fun time in order to have an opportunity to have longevity in the game. The Cam and Strick Podcast is brought to you by CarShield. You know, nothing more frustrating, Cam, than when that engine light comes on, and you know right off the bat you're going to have to spend thousands oh. of dollars <gasps> to repair your vehicle. Call 800-857-2481. Mention the promo code CAM mm. or visit carshield.com and use the code CAM to save 10%. Yeah. That's carshield.com. A deductible may apply. Save yourself money. Cam. Sign up and get your coverage now Cam. with carshield.com. Cam. Now back to the Cam. interview.
Kim, yeah, I've never put a bad thing that? in my body, Gary. I've never put a bad thing in my body, and that's why I lasted so long. No, I, I just you're, you're you're right on that. It is a lifestyle, and I burn both ends of the candle, dude. Like I I work my ass off, and anytime I did party hard, I would feel so bad the next day where I felt like I had to get up five more hours early, and it just would it would ruin me even more because you're just you're just tired. But my question to you is, how do you manage the egos on all these other teams? Everybody who's a trainer. Has an ego, Gary. You know exactly what I'm talking about. That with, with with trainers with the NHL and stuff like that. So when you're when you're training all these guys, everybody ha- everybody has a different vision. So how do you deal with the egos with all the trainers with all, all the NHL teams? Well, some I'll be honest, and this is what this is why I believe we have a successful business. NHL strength coaches are in the trenches all winter, yep. and when you're NHL strength coach, you're expected to go above and beyond being just a strength coach, right? Like you're in in a lot of cases, if you're a young guy, you're hanging equipment at two in the morning, right? Like you're helping the trainers and it's not, in my eyes, it's not fair to those strength coaches and why I say to strength coaches that we mentor and that we intern unto us, be careful what you wish for because an NHL strength coach job is not as glorious as you might think it is. And, and, I, and I feel like uh, those strength coaches in the summertime, they have a real tough time. If they know their players are in a good spot, a lot of the strength coaches are good with it. If, you're, if they, you say, hey, I'm training with Gary Roberts and his group, 90% of the strength coaches say, awesome. I think you're in a good spot. If you need any help, call me. And I just make sure I send those kids back rocking for, you know, Damn right. rocking for the fitness tests and mm-hmm. making sure they're in shape. And then I, I usually, so early on, I would say I got some calls. I'll be honest, guys. I get very few calls from strength coaches now in the summer saying, hey, what are you doing with my guy? Yeah. Because they know when the guy comes back, he's fit. I mean, I had this talk with, with John Tortorello one day, and I said, John, if Josh Anderson fails your fitness test, I will fly to Columbus, and I'll do your fitness test, okay? I will do all your fitness tests. Because yeah. Josh Anderson's not failing any fitness tests. He's a machine. Mm. Right? He had a tough year, right? He had yeah. he didn't get off to a good shot start. He had a shoulder injury. He knows his shoulder wasn't great going into the season. So he Josh has got you know, Josh is doing some work with us right now. He is getting himself this kid's gonna be a machine when we get him back healthy. Um, but he went through a tough year and didn't have a great year. So so he knows if, if that's where he's going back to, Torts is, hey, Torts has been successful for a while. He de- de- demands a lot from his players. And if you're going to play for John Tortorella, you better be in shape. And that's our goal for Josh is to get him in the best shape and healthy as we can. So if he goes back to Columbus, uh, I don't get yelled at by Torts. Oh, man. He yells at you too. It's I don't unbelievable. Want to get yelled at him either. <laughs> oh, there, yeah, he takes no prisoners. No. So yeah, he does. Yeah. But are there strength mm-hmm. coaches in the league that you cringe? Like you work with these kids all summer long, you get them ready to go, and then you know the the program that you're sending them off to isn't going to necessarily help them, and it could even set them back. I'm not asking you to bury anybody or name names. But do you have situations like that where you have to stay in constant contact with your clients throughout the season too, because the program that's set up for them with their with their club team it's always different isn't yeah. isn't necessarily what's best for them personally? Yeah, and I agree. I, there's some there's a lot of players that we give programs to, and we make suggestions to the strength coaches, and we have communications with the strength coaches. Say, hey, listen, this this kid had this this summer. This we we gave him something. You know, you can look at it. Uh, hopefully you'll let them do what we're recommending and in some situations guys i would agree it's like anything uh i i've i've learned to to kind of maybe i'm softer today because i'm older um but i've learned to just say hey listen manage it if you are feeling like you're doing something that's that's not right for you then try to sit with the strength coach like try to work those relationships out between the player and the strength coach and i try to just stay back if there's a situation that I really feel it's detrimental to the player's health, then I'll reach out to the strength coach or Adrian will reach out to the strength coach and say, Hey, you know what? Like, this is what we're seeing. This is what we saw all summer. Uh, we would recommend this. And, and we just hope that those strength coaches, we're not trying to tell them they don't know what they're doing, uh, but we just spent 90 days in the gym with a player. 
And we kind of know at the end of the summer, okay, this kid does not need to be doing this exercise this, summer, this winter. He needs to be doing this, right? Yeah. But, but you guys know in hockey and pro sports, he's mentioned about egos. Um, you know, I have, a, I have a philosophy, no matter what NHL team I'm working for, it's not about, it's not about me anymore. It's not about, it's not about the head, head AT. It's not about the director of sports performance. It's about the player and our job. And we get paid to give the player the best advice and the best service we can. And if you can't park your ego at the door, then I say to the organization, don't hire that person mm, there was. because it's not, it's not about you anymore. Mm-hmm. It's about the player. You're working for a pro team. And that's why I say when you're a strength coach, and I know this, uh, Dougie Davidson, and I love him like a brother. He has worked for me for years. Uh, he went to Wilkes-Barre and, and worked in the minors in Pittsburgh. And then there was an opportunity when he, when Vegas came out. Uh, so I had an opportunity to help him get to Vegas. And he's done he's done an amazing job there. I watch him. And that's why Vegas, I believe, one of the reasons they're so successful is because of the team that they put in place to take care of the players. And and, and both strength coaches that are in Vegas uh, and, and dealing with their American League team, uh, they do an amazing job for that team. And I, 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 I you know, I believe that's what it that's what's so important for NHL teams is to hire the right people. So that goes uh, hand in hand right there, Gary, right? That goes hand in hand. I mean, the the success on the ice for an NHL team, it's it's not just about having great players. You truly believe that who's available to them and, you know, I mean, from the head coach on down, including the strength coach, they have an impact on what you're seeing on the ice. Oh, a huge impact. You know, it's a – I always say, like, I was fortunate to meet some amazing people I always said, like, I had an amazing team behind the team. And and it's important to have that. And it's important to put, to put uh, you know, like strength coaches. There, there's a lot of NHL teams, in my opinion, you know, that, that still don't pay their strength coaches their true value. And and it's a tough gig to be really, really – think about it as a, as a strength coach in the NHL. You've got to build the trust of the player, but you've also got to – you're getting paid by the organization. Right, so you've got to f- walk that fine line of building relationships, but also making players accountable if they step across the line. And it it is a it takes a special personality, a uh, special person to be able to do that. So that's why, you know, I've always said this. I'm in this business because of what strength coaches that I came across in my career did for me, and how truly thankful I am that I came across those people. And I spoke of Lauren Goldenberg. I'll speak of Matt Nichol. Um, had an opportunity to work with you, with Andy O'Brien in Florida for a short period of time. Like I've come across some amazing strength coaches along the way, and and uh, and doctors that have helped me with my neck. and And I truly believe it takes a team behind the team to to, to help players and uh, and organizations. I think you know need to need to make sure that they're investing in that part of their world in order to have a healthier team and and in the end it's it's a more successful team all right take me back to when you were a player like were you ahead of the game were you working out after games and 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 coaches were like hey you got to relax gary you got a game tomorrow night we got back to back whatever i mean what was your routine when you were a player in terms of you know and compared to what the the rest of the players in the league were doing were you were you way beyond you know your time I would say um, in the first, well, guys, like the first seven years of my career, 20 to 27, I was finding my way like every other young pro. Um, you got to remember it was drafted in 84. I played my first NHL game in, in 86. Um, so, you know, was, was, was starting to find my way and having some successful seasons around 26, 27. But that you know, back then it was it was that lifestyle that killed me. Um, you know, too many late nights. Uh, you know, no different than anybody else in the late eighties and, and early nineties. Uh, you know, a few too many beverages and a few too many chicken wings. And uh, and I would say that I was a hard worker. I had to be a hard worker because I wasn't. You know, obviously you guys know this. I wasn't uh, the most skilled guy around. Uh, but what made what made it easier for me as, as I filled a role on a line that I was able to play with better players that, that in the end made me a better player. You know, my first Stanley Cup with the Calgary Flames, my line mates were Joe Newendike and Hawk and Lube. Mm. 
right? And 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 they made me they made me a better player, and I was fortunate to be in those situations. If you look at the lines I played on in my career, um, I filled a role for those for those for those players, and and that didn't that didn't have that in their tool bag, but. But I more more often than not got got lined up with some pretty good players that made me better. Um, so, so in, in in saying that, I didn't take great care of myself in my twenties, which actually led me to my injuries. Mm. It wasn't until I was thirty that I really figured out, okay, if I take better care of myself off the ice and rebuild my body from my serious neck injuries, maybe I have a chance. You know, maybe I have a chance if I do. I kept working at you know working when I was at the rink. And I would, Lauren Gordon Goldenberg gave me programs all the time, but I would, I would run five miles in the morning, go in and do some, do some upper body. So I had my leg, had huge legs. So I didn't think I had to lift legs, do up, do upper body. And then I would race to the golf course and play 36 holes of golf oh. and, and drink and, and have a few beers and eat some wings. And, and, uh, I do that every day. And that's how we lived in the eighties. Uh, five miles, you know, not, Gary, five, wait, wait, wait. Me. five miles. You ran five I miles. Would, uh, Come on. Oh yeah, I used to. Well, your your head coach in St. Louis, Mr. Craig Berube, and I, mm-hmm. uh, we had a three, five, and seven mile trail, and uh, wow. he would meet, he would meet me in the morning, and we would run one of those, and then we'd come in and we'd lift, and that was a little later. Right? That's in the nineties after the, the Gilmore trade. Yeah. And, uh, and, but Chief was an amazing worker. I absolutely loved to train with this guy. He was an animal in the gym. And and if and, he, and of course if I didn't do what he told me to do, he threatened my life. <laughs> which um, you listened to him, by the way. Which I, yeah, which I listened. To him. But I, but I did fight Greg Ruby, and I always I always like often I like to pull up the video and send to him and see see how many times I hit you. Look, <laughs> and I, he didn't phase I, him. I said, uh, yeah, you know what he says to me? Huh. He says, "Well, yeah, but they were pillows. You throw pillows." <laughs> he says to me. I didn't feel one of those. Things. Yeah, I've heard that before. That's funny. So so. Is so he, yeah, is he, yeah. Is he, is he pillows, still on your program now? Feel one punch. Is he still on your program now? No, he's he not. But I, I, I have talked to him recently, and he still he likes to he still loves to lift. And what he you, was and he was a guy that I enjoyed lifting with. Like he loves to do bench press. He still trains his legs. I mean, he's 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 a, he's, he's a, still he's a, a, he was an amazing Gary, amazing teammate. Gary, he's still a toughest guy in the NHL. Okay, <laughs> he's still a toughest guy in the NHL right like, now. Like. Yeah. yeah, no, just ask him too. But he, oh, he listen. You. But he, but I, I do love the guy. He's one of my one of my all time favorite teammates. I would say is Craig Berube. So I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed my time with him in Calgary and uh, and training with him and, and playing with him. Uh, but he hasn't changed, and that's why it's so nice to see a guy like that that's just so real mm-hmm. uh, have success in the National Hockey League. Would you give, give me a, give me an example of like the difference? Like you you've been through. It's so funny. I, I you know I, we always look up everybody whenever uh, we do these interviews. And uh, gosh, I I saw you. I, I couldn't believe I even played against you playing that long. But what's the biggest difference with the training camps in the '80s, the late '80s, and how you train compared to now? Like, give me an example of walking in a training camp and seeing what you had to do in the late '80s, and you look back on it now and you're like, what the fuck was that all about? Like, give give us an example. Well, I, I think it's just you know, and and I I say the the amount of volume of work that you had to do in one day back then, right? Like yeah. you you've got to do a two mile run, and, and maybe you've got to do a max VO two, and then you got to do a wind gate, and then you got to do this this the strength portion of the. You know the bench press and the and the uh, pull ups and the dips, and believe it or not, back then I don't ever remember doing a squat test. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was all upper body because the way that I felt hockey players were back then, and I was like that. I didn't really have to train my legs because all I did was ride the bike and skate. Yeah. So why would I need to lift weights on my legs? And 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 I don't remember in Calgary. I we had a really fit team in the eighties in Calgary. Um, I, that's when I went there, but most of the guys are doing upper body workouts and not really training their legs. So I don't ever remember doing a leg strength test when I played in the National Hockey League in my first, you know, 10 years as a Calgary Flame. Chicks so, like big legs, by the way, just, just so you know. Yeah, I don't know why. It's but, not just upper body. <laughs> but I know that the next day, you think about how long we were at the rink in training camp back then. There wasn't a, there wasn't a, 
three hour rule. Yeah. That right. included your on ice, your off ice from the moment you walked through the door. There wasn't that in the in the eighties and early nineties. And you could be at the rink all day. All I know is that that uh that it was just it was different. And and that's what I, I mean, there are still some NHL strength coaches or sorry, NHL coaches that 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 I look at the fitness testing because the players show me the fitness testing I have to do and I go, What? You gotta do all that in one day? So there are still some coaches out there that the expectations are of the players that it's a mental test, right? And you guys don't need to, I don't need to tell you who those coaches are, but it's a mental test and you have to, you have to, you have to get through that to, to, for the coach to say, okay, well maybe this kid's going to be okay. He made it through that day. Right. Yeah. Uh, I look at it. My whole thing is what's, what's the risk and reward? What, what do we deal with all winter nowadays is injuries. So why would you put a player in a situation that if you, you know you're giving them too much in a day to make them mentally tougher, but you risk losing a player to a groin or a hip mm-hmm. or some type of injury? Why would you risk that, in my opinion? And I, I guess in the, my line of work today, I would say absolutely don't risk it. Um, reduce your fitness testing. You see, guys see the pace of the game today. If you're out of shape and you can't hook and hold like we used to be able to do to slow the game down. Oh, God. You're, it's pretty evident whether you're in shape or not 20 minutes into practice. Yep. Uh, so I would I would do less testing, and I would and I but I would pick the right test, which we do. We do fitness testing. But pick the right test, and don't kill the players because it's you know it's a marathon, not a sprint. Damn mm. okay, right. So listen, a lot of our listeners they may not be familiar with Gary Roberts' story. So you miss a complete season, and then you come back and you play more than ten years after you miss a full season. Serious neck injury. Tell us what happened, Gary. How bad was it, and what allowed you to return to play? Well, I would say um, what happened, uh, I was hit from behind uh, in the early 90s by, by Bob Rouse in Toronto at the um, at Maple Leaf Gardens, and I, and I lost the feeling in my arms for probably five minutes, six minutes. Uh, they got me up on a stretcher. And they took me to Wellesley Hospital where they cut the equipment off me and they did a, uh, they did a scan. And that was the start. Like that was the start of my problems to finally, to finally uh, 1994 playing in the Stanley Cup playoffs. Um, I no longer could cut my food. Uh, I would, uh, I would have to you know, almost need help to tie my skates up and then I would take my left arm my left hand and I would lift my right arm up just before I was going to grab the knob of my stick to skate out on the ice for warm up with a neck collar on. So I I literally, I literally had no use of my right arm and I was playing in the Stanley cup playoffs against the Vancouver Canucks. How'd you even get the puck out of zone, Gary? Like seriously, I couldn't even get it out with two arms. So I literally went out there and I, yeah, and I, uh, I tried to defend myself. I would stand in front of the net. I can remember playing against Vancouver in that series, and Dana Merzins cross-checking me from behind, and I'd lose the feeling, complete feeling in both arms, and I'd come back to the bench, and and Dave King would say, "Rob, you ready to go?" And I'm like, "No, guys, I got no feeling in my arms right now. Give me a couple seconds." Mm. Jesus. And uh, and then I'd get the feeling back, and I'd go back out, and I'll be honest. Uh, Game seven, Pavel Burry scored in a breakaway to beat us out of the playoffs. We were up three games to one. We lost four games to three. And it was the only time in my NHL career that I was happy I didn't have to go to the rink the next day. Wow. I remember that goal, too. Wow. And so then you miss a full year. What did you do during that year? Did did you – was your mindset, I got to find a way to get back and play? Were you content if you never played again? Where was your mind mind at, at, at that time? Well, you got to remember that was around the time, right? We had the stoppage yeah. in '95. I was trying to get healthy. I was trying to play through it. I finally, I finally ended up having uh, two neck surgeries um, in in uh, in in '95 and '96, and then coming back to play for for I think another thirty something games the year that uh, I finally retired in June of 1996 because I started to have symptoms again and I swore to myself after my neck surgery if I came back to play and I had the same symptoms loss of feeling in my arms burners 
uh, then I would retire. And I, I got sandwiched in a game against Chicago late in that, that, that year. I'd come back and played like 40 games. And uh, I remember, I remember, I remember a tearful uh, receiving the Bill Masterton for a comeback player of the year. Yep. And uh, and having to retire that night, and uh, that was June of '96. And then I, I went away from the game. I just said, okay, I've had enough. There's nothing. Doctors said, listen, your your nerves are just too damaged in your neck, and we're not sure they're ever going to regenerate. So we think you we think you're done. And I truly thought I was done. I truly thought I was done. And then in uh, November, I went. To, well, I guess end of October, I went to a Flames game. In 1996, and I, <clears throat> I couldn't watch. I, I, my phone wasn't ringing. All my buddies were playing. I was, oh man, you know, I was in the prime of my career. Right, I was 30 years old, and back then that was your prime. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember leaving the rink. I couldn't deal with it, and I just uh, so I went home. And uh, remember the next day, I, I know Lauren Goldenberg and I talked often. And I reached out to him, and I said, "Man, I, I'm missing it so much." And, uh, and that's when he. He started to help me kind of find some people. I got some messages from people saying, "Hey, we think we can help you." And I started my started my comeback trail. I I spent uh, hours on a table getting treatment and started to rebuild my body and change my lifestyle. And uh, <clears throat> so, from November of '96 till September of '97, <clears throat> I basically went to school for that whole period of time. Cam and Strick podcast here for our boy Dan Bellman with Bellman.com. Yeah, baby. You need some new wheels? Mm. Why not get a Cadillac, a Buick, a GMC? Head out to Troy today. And again, don't forget about Chrysler Dodge Jeep Ram right across the street. No doubt. Right there in Troy, Missouri. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Visit them online. Check out their new selection, the pre-owned selection, the best service you will find anywhere in the country. Bellman.com. B-E-H-L-M-A-N-N.com. Get yourself some new wheels in time for the summer. Yeah. Now back to the interview. You must have been pretty depressed, though. Like, okay, you're hockey oh, your whole life. And you didn't, and, and at that point, I, I don't know if you had a, a ton of money in the bank to where you're like, eh, well, if nothing happens, I'm, I'm good. I'm going to sit in a, you know, sit in Lake Ontario or whatever I want to do. Like, at that point, you're like, I, I'm not done yet. Like, how, de- was it like a, like people get concussions and they're depressed and they're just like, ah, were you like that? Was it just so depressing? You're like, I got to get, I got to yeah. figure this out, man. I got to get back at this. Oh, I just remember waking up one morning and saying, like, I can't live like this anymore. And it was just, you know, drinking too much and yeah. feeling sorry for myself and no different than anybody else in those situations, right? Mm. So I, uh, hold on one second, guys. Sorry, guys. I was getting too dry there. You all right, big boy? You, you okay? No problem. Gosh, I'm choking out. No, Choke, man. I'm choking out over here. I, I'm, I, you're, you're challenging my mental state right now. Oh, you haven't man. done many of these, have you, Gary? You haven't done many interviews, have you? I, mean, I don't see you much. No, and I don't, yeah. and I don't talk about it. I don't I try to talk about my uh, yeah, my career's uh, amazing. Uh, like I, I feel so grateful to have played and, and did what I did at the end of my career, but... But it's not something I like to talk about mm. too often. Well, we appreciate yeah, you, you Jesus, sharing it with us. I mean, honestly, um, but I, I do want to know when you came back and played, how much risk was there for your health to come back and play? Did they warn you and said, hey, if you could suffer serious, serious injury, if you try to come back and play, did you ignore, ignore the doctors? Like, what were they telling you when you came back and played? Well, in 19, um, so in, in uh, I trained from, November till till June, and I let the Calgary Flames know I was going to make a comeback. And uh, <clears throat> they brought me in and said, "Okay." They put me through a physical, and they looked at me and said, "Well, you look pretty good." And I said, "Well, but guys, that's what I've done for the last, you know, basically seven months, eight months." <clears throat> and I just said, "I." Um, I think I can go back and play, and they they passed all the fitness tests. Of course, and then I remember. Yeah, no shit, you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then uh, I can remember uh, 
um, Al Coates and Winnie Mae Wissa basically saying, like, like, you look great, um, but when you, we look at your MRI that we took, uh, we don't think you have any chance at longevity. So uh, so they didn't clear me. Uh, so they, they, sorry, they, they cleared me because they had to, they had to make me a free agent. And, um, and then they, they told me they were going to trade me. So, so they didn't want to take the risk because they were going to have to pay back my salary, right? So the insurance company paid my salary for that year. And if I came back to play, then they would have to, they'd have to uh, give me a qualifying offer, but also pay back the, 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 the salary from the year previous. So it was a $4 million risk for them oh, yeah. okay. to have at the time to have me come back and play for them. So they, uh, they traded me to Carolina where I walked into Jimmy Rutherford's office and I went through the same fitness tests. I went through the same, uh, physical with their doctor and, uh, their doctor said the same thing. You look great. You pass all the tests. Um, but I, I truly don't think you, you have a chance to play for very long. So these are two doctors of two teams that have told me this. <clears throat> And uh, I don't. I have never told this story, but Jimmy Rutherford looked across the table and he said, "How do you feel, really?" And I said, "I said, Jimmy, I feel amazing." I said, "It's the best I've ever felt in my life." And he said, "Well, I'm prepared to take the risk if you are." Oh man! <clears throat> and that was it. Like the trade was void. If Jimmy Rutherford says, "Hey, we're just not prepared to take the risk," I mean, I owe Jimmy Rutherford my comeback. Mm-hmm. Yeah, where would you be if if he didn't give you that opportunity? Oh, would you be doing what you're doing right now, Gary? Yeah, I agree. Would I be doing what I'm doing right now? Would another team have taken a chance on me at some point and gave me a walk-on opportunity to make their team? Um, I ended up signing a three-year deal with the Carolina Hurricanes the next day, and you know the, the rest is history. And uh, so that's why there's certain people you come across in your career that that have major impacts on what you become and, and, and what you feel when it's all over. And, uh, and Jimmy Rutherford is one of those guys that, you know, changed, gave me a second opportunity to play. And then I was fortunate to make it as far as I did. You know, I retired just before my 43rd birthday. Um, and I truly believe it's because of, you know, you, they always say you don't, you know, you don't realize how much you love something until you lose it. Mm Mm-hmm. And um, some amazing people along the way that have said things to me that really stand out, right? <clears throat> Our good friend Brad McCrimmon, who passed away, if yep. you guys know him, a oh, yeah. plane crash. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I remember he used to always say to me, you know, Roy, make them cut the effing skates off you. Yeah, mm. baby. Right? Yeah, baby. Play as, long as, play as long as you can, Roy, used to always say to me, because you'll never have any more fun than you're having right now. Damn right. You feel like you know. do you feel like in hockey though, and you've been around the game so long, like, like there's hockey karma. I mean there is. You work your ass off and do the right thing in a game and you're good to people and you just just do the right thing. Like it, it all comes back in a weird way or another. And I think that kinda happened with you too. Do you kinda believe in that a little bit? I do. I believe what I always say to my team that I work with, I say, guys, listen, what goes around comes around. Be a good teammate, treat people well. You know, be passionate about what you do. Um, you know, try to be great at what you do, and and you you know you, you're gonna. It's not always gonna go your way, but uh, in the end, in the end, there's a reward for you. Exactly. So, what did uh, playing in Toronto do for you? And, and I'm curious, Gary, did you ever have another scare after you came back and you signed that three year contract with Carolina? So I ended up having uh, some injuries in my career. Obviously, I had some shoulder surgeries and bicep tendons repaired in Toronto after 02 playoffs. Oh, um, but it wasn't until my last year against the Tampa in Tampa Bay, I got a little bump in the corner in training camp. And uh, I had my first stinger in 12 years. Mm. Oh, yeah. And I got a stinger and lost the feeling in my arm, and and, uh, and it was in a it was in a scrimmage in in training camp after I had signed there, and I just had this like, whoa, what was that? You know, where did that come from? And uh, took a couple of days after that, and never had another issue, and until still today, I'm 54, so I've been retired for what 11 years, 
and I haven't had a burner since. And, you know, I train every day. I do something for an hour for my body every day, whether it's yoga, whether it's swimming, whether it's biking, whether it's lifting. I just try to, you know, have a routine. And then you guys know, Cam, like when you're a player, you have a routine. And the toughest part about retirement is you lose your routine. Oh, God, Gary. Oh, God. I know. Right? And then quarantine hits, and you, get, you really lose your routine. <laughs> I, lo- I lost my radio routine during quarantine, which is even worse. So, but, but when you're in Toronto, the year you scored 29 goals, like what clicked for you where all of a sudden you found that offensive magic again? Well, Matt, Matt Sundin and Steve Thomas. I mean, I, like I said, I was fortunate to play with <laughs> so I, You play with me, Andy. Listen, listen, I'm no dummy. I, I know I was fortunate to play with good players, right? Oh, yeah. like, mm-hmm. uh, but I also came into my, my, you know, I was born in North York. My mom and dad were at every game. Hmm. Uh, I had friends close by. I felt, you know, I always felt pressure to succeed. But when you're in Toronto and you're in the, in the you know, the hotbed of hockey, um, and playing for your your team that you have watched as a kid, there was I could just feel the pressure going to the rink every night. Like shit, I better be good tonight because my brother's going to be yelling at me when the oh, game's over. Yeah. God, you suck tonight. Oh, like my brother, yeah. my brother was my 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 biggest fan, Greg, and oh, yeah. my biggest critic. Wow. If I if I stunk, I heard about it, and he didn't miss too many games when I was at Leafs. So I, my phone would ring when the game's over, and he'd either say, "Ah, you're pretty good tonight," I thought, or gosh, what are you doing out there? Like, did you not teach you when you're back checking? You're not supposed to do the pitchfork. Like, keep your stick on the ice when you're back <laughs> oh, checking. Shit, Gary. Keep your stick on the ice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I said, I didn't pitchfork. He says, you go go to the rink tomorrow, watch the video. You're actually pitchforking down the ice back checking. And I'm like, oh, come on. I couldn't have been. So my point being is when I played in Toronto, I always felt, I felt even extra pressure to be prepared to play. And I would say to you guys, that's what I miss today. Everybody says, well, you missed the game. I said, yeah, I, I, I really, like, I miss the game. I tell players every day, play as long as you can. I mm-hmm. miss the game. Yeah. But for me, it was the preparation that I miss. It was yeah. it was standing on the blue line at the ACC uh, in the national anthem. Oh, God. And, and standing there and saying, gosh, I've really done my homework. Like, I'm prepared to play tonight. I'm going to kick some ass tonight. Mm. And I and I miss that feeling. I go to the Leaf games today. I take my sons, and I go down to – I go to about, you know, 10 games a year, take my boys down, and when the National Anthem comes on, I get chills because that's what I, I so miss. I. I bet. I, I miss the preparation. I miss the saying to myself – if I always say to myself, it's like preparing for a test. If you if you do your preparation, then the, then the test seems easy. But if you didn't, if you didn't prepare, then you're scrambling like hell trying to pu- just get through it. And and I th- and I thought I felt like that's what I became. You know, that's what I became really good at. I became really good at mentally and physically preparing for games. Where I stood on the blue line before the game, I knew I was ready to play, and uh, and it was a good feeling. And I miss that feeling more than any feeling uh, playing in the National Hockey League. Gary, how is that feeling? And I did the, the same thing with the national anthem, though. Eh? Did you ever like? Am I weird for saying this? But like, I would get teary eyed during the national anthem. I would get teary eyed, especially in Chicago too, when all oh, the crowds going crazy, Gary. And you're like, okay. And I'm looking over, and John Scott's over there. And I'm like, okay, I'm doing this first. Like, I would honestly get teary eyed. That's how much emotion comes at you right before the uh, puck drop there. <coughs> Well, you think about all the anxiety you feel right before the game, and you're and you're and if you're a guy that looks at the roster and go, "Holy, holy shit, I might have to fight that guy." But if I don't fight that guy, I'm definitely going to have to fight this guy because my buddy's going to fight him. Like, can you imagine having that early in my career? I had to do that. I remember looking at the rosters, going, "Holy shit!" Like the anxiety you feel and the emotion you feel in that in that stage of preparing for the game. I mean, you just talked about Chicago. Like, I I, I had chills on my spine because I thought I was going to get. Killed killed after the national anthem right oh like God, he, yeah, you got ben wilson out there oh and kurt fraser God. and all, all these guys oh. right like bobby mcgill if you look yeah. at my fight i had with bobby mcgill one day when he was a hawk i i thought i didn't think it was ever going to end <laughs> you know, <laughs> know like that. so 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 playing the hawks i i'd have chills up my spine during the national anthem and yeah. you it would be like the best feeling but also like holy sh- i better get my shit together here because <laughs> This is going to be a war out here, and I felt the same way in the spectrum because those were the oh, teams, yeah. right? The mm. the big 
the, you know, the big bad flyers, and then you had the Hawks, and they always had a reputation of being big and tough, and 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 fear. I mean, fear is an amazing thing, guys. That's yes. all I can say. Um, so yeah, so uh, hey, it's the greatest game in the world. I feel so fortunate to have played as long as I did, get a second opportunity to play, and uh, I couldn't be more grateful for the experiences that I've had along the way and the people I've met, uh, mostly. Andy Strickland and Cam Jansen yeah. here for you for GadgetBuyback.com. Yeah. Gadget Lab, they got a store here locally if you're in St. Louis, 5541 Telegraph Road. Here's the deal. you got an old phone, maybe a cracked tablet. Maybe it's perfect, but it's a little bit older. Mm. Turn it in right now, www.GadgetBuyback.com. Upgrade your devices, phones, computers, watches. Anything. Doesn't have to be Apple either. No. Get those tablets turned in. Again, www.gadgetbuyback.com, 877-772-8880. Now back to the interview. Yeah. All right, Gary. Will there ever be, and why aren't there more Gary Roberts? Why aren't there more Wendell Clarks? Why, why, why don't we see that killer toughness? Or I'll knock you out with a punch, and I'll go anybody toe to toe, and I'll keep my face right under to eat punches, and I could still shoot a, a snapshot right across the blue line and have the skill set. Why don't we see more Tom Wilsons in the game now? Yeah, I, I guys, I mean, I, I deal with it often. I talk to players often about. They ask me, you know, like, what do I need to do? And I'm like, I'm like, buddy. Like, I'm not trying to be a bad guy here, but you need a little more bite in your game. Like, you need to go in the corner and say, I'm coming out with the puck. And you don't need to go in there and fight the guy. But Mm -hmm. you've got to have that ultimate competitiveness that when you go in the corner, the puck is mine. Yes. Right? And I I say, you know, I talk to reporters often. And, you know, we love the skill. And don't get me wrong, I love the skill, and the players are really, really skilled. And there are some, there are some tough guys. And Tom Wilson, you mentioned him, is yeah, tough right. as nails. Mm-hmm. You appreciate that player, but there's, there's just not that same attitude anymore. Not that same animosity in the game where you could have your best friend lined up beside you, mm. and you wouldn't talk to him. There it is, right? Because. He wouldn't talk to him. Like, I played against Joe Noondike. Doug Riseboro made me play center when Joe Noondike got traded from Calgary to Dallas. And Doug Riseboro said, I want you to be hard on your buddy tonight. Yeah. Put me at center against Joe Noondike. I didn't talk to Joe Noondike, one of my best friends my whole life. Right. Didn't talk to him the whole game. I didn't even want to look at him. But I tried to win every face-off. Like, I, it was like my last face-off. He's and I, was, I sucked. He's and I enemy. sucked at face-offs, mm-hmm. and he was one of the best ever in the NHL, that guy. <laughs> the best. So, so do you appreciate, like, one of your clients, like Matthew Kachuk, just in terms of how he plays? Because he brings it every single night. He may not have the, the fighting element, but he's willing to go if he has he's to. He's in there. But, but he, he's got a brand of his game unmatched by just about everybody else <laughs> in the world right now, Gary. He is an old-school, old-school boy. Um, I, I say, you know, the way that you play, you might want your brother's body. Um, <laughs> not your dad. Brady is like, <laughs> no, well, and I'm not going to get into that no, argument. Okay, don't no, worry, we will. We right, well, know him. Yeah. We're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah, but I, but I obviously love the way uh, Keith played, and I played lots of hockey against them, and respect their family and, and what what they've done with their boys. Those boys come to the rink and come to the gym in my facility. And there isn't two more respectful human beings that I've worked with. Mm. Uh, they are amazing, uh, amazing people. Uh, they treat my staff first class. Everybody just looks forward to having them back every year. Um, so I can't say enough about those boys. And uh, they, I always say, gosh, your mom must be really nice. You know? <laughs> she is. She's a <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And they tell me she's the rock. Yeah. You know? She but, runs but, the show. Yeah. Yeah, but they but off the ice, you you couldn't imagine that Matthew Kachuk would ever act like that on the ice because when you when you deal with him in the gym, he couldn't he couldn't be nicer. And you get him on the ice, and it's like there's an old school hockey player, right? There's right. like so I, I I respect him. I respect how he plays. Uh, of course, he's you know, and I always say like, and I'm sure his dad says this like when you play like that, you got to answer the bell. You got to answer the bell once in a while. 
doesn't mean he has to do it all the time. Doesn't mean he has to do it against the tough guys. But and he did, and I give him full marks for what he did. Um, but we, you know, we are probably going to spend a little more time, and we do date together, uh, working on his working on that part of his game. If you know what I mean. Yeah, call me up. Yeah. Uh, because, yeah. Well, but, there, but there's still an element, guys. Like I still believe until they take body contact completely out of hockey, there's still an intimidation factor. And when you know Tom Wilson's on the ice, no different than when Scott Stevens was on the ice. You were in. You know, did you play with Scott in Jersey? <clears throat> Yeah, I went to training camp. Yeah. He's the one guy I didn't hit, by the way. The one guy I didn't well, like, go near. Like, yeah, like, well, we would literally say to each other, we'd go around the ice and say, hey, uh, Stevens is on the ice. Heads oh, up, God. Like, mm-hmm. like, and, and I'm sure players today do the same thing when Tom Wilson's on the ice. Yeah, of course they do. Because you can't avoid right? so, hits, Gary. You can't avoid – you can avoid a fight, <laughs> but you can't avoid hits. They're going to come at no, you. Especially, especially when nobody is slowing anybody down out right. there. So there when they go. so Tom Wilson decides he's going to run around, he's running around twice as fast as we used to run around because we used to have to fight through three hooks and a couple Boom. holds yep. before we got to a guy. Hey, listen, I got to ask Tom, you. Will, Tom Wilson's allowed to just go full tilt at a guy, and a guy doesn't even put a stick on him because he, he's going to get a hooking penalty. Well, that's, like, that's what saved my I career, think. by the way, exactly. Gary. That's what, sa- yeah. that's what saved my hey, career. Hey, when they changed the rules, I really thought I, I thought Dallas Drake was going to kill somebody. <laughs> I mean, well, they, he did kill people, and, and he did. Well, he they, killed people. But when they came into the new system, no hooking, no grabbing. Oh I mean, God. he just had free reign. Hey, before we let you, I got to ask you though. You you touched on it, and I, I wanted to ask you because, you know, I used to follow your Calgary teams because you guys were so good, obviously. And Gilmore and, and Ramage, a lot of these guys got traded to St. Louis. Al McKinnis has come <laughs> here, who we've gotten to know real well. Right. <clears throat> um, but yeah. it's funny that. I didn't know you and Joe Newendike were best friends as kids until a couple of days ago. I probably should have known that. But I always associated you and Newendike together. It was always Roberts and Newendike, Roberts and Newendike. So how close were you guys as kids, and how crazy was it that all of a sudden you both become NHL stars on the same team? Yeah, I would say it was one of my one of my uh, most memorable moments when – you know, he was a September B day, so I got drafted uh, to Calgary in the first round of 84. And then uh, he had gone to Cornell because he never, ever played junior hockey. And then, <clears throat> uh, so he's an 85 draft draft year, and they end up training Kent Nielsen. I remember watching the draft. Uh, Calgary traded Kent Nielsen uh, to I think Minnesota for their pick, and they drafted uh, – they drafted Joe Newdike and we both we both couldn't get each other because we were calling each other on our home phones. We didn't have cell phones back then, so uh, to to play like we listen when we were five. I played for the Wrens. Our, our squirts were called the Birds, right? I was I played the Wrens. He played for the Owls. <laughs> right? So we. I'm sorry, we but that's played, a goofy ass name. I'm sorry. Right? We were we were named we were named our whole squirt league in Whit in Brooklyn. Whippy was named after after birds. Right, so we, so I played for the Rens and he played for the Owls. We were five years old, and we had played, we had played every year of hockey and then lacrosse together. We we lived our whole life together, and then we played, you know, our first ten years of the National Hockey League, eighty four, uh, sorry, eighty six to ninety six. We played together in Calgary, and yeah, we're he was um, he's he, like I say that that guy that guy would say to me on faceoffs like. Rob, like you don't need to fight Gord Donnelly again, right? Like, like you're a better player, like you know. And he and I'd be honest, like I, I, you know, I'd be fighting out there, Winnipeg, Edmonton, and I'd be playing with him on the line. And the moment somebody touched him, I'd be, you know, I'd be fighting somebody. And I wasn't, you know, I never really had to fight the heavyweights because there was always Tim Hunter would always fight the heavyweight, but Tim Hunter was Poor certainly guy. the guy that <laughs> Tim Hunter would look at me and go, "Robs, you know, you don't have to ever fight the toughest guy." But you better be there to, to fight the second toughest guy. Okay. So I literally look at rosters and go, okay, who's the second toughest guy in this team, <laughs> right? And that, and that's what I did early in my career. But finally, Joe Newnick was a guy that said, Rob's like, you're you're a better player than that. Like you don't have to do that. And so he actually helped me, you know, be, become a better player. And I and I did it in junior early in my junior career. And then I started to score goals. And then I did it in my NHL. I had to do a managerial career. And then I was fortunate enough to play with good enough players that I started scoring some goals. Um, but it was definitely that was my journey and my kind of you know my uh, my path to the NHL. That's what that's what I had to do, and and everybody goes through a different path. Uh, but but uh, him and I have a very strong relationship, and uh, 
always has. I always have. So I'm very grateful for that. We got a couple more for you here, Gary, man. I appreciate you coming on and, uh, you know, you know, it's, it's emotional. You don't do too many of these, and we appreciate you 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 bringing it for us here. But I, I did want to ask you, who's the besides m- myself who you played against? Who's the most well put together <laughs> athlete that you've seen? Now that you've trained, that you played against, that you could look at and be like, that son of a bitch is a, the the the, the, <clears throat> the biggest freak I've ever seen in my life. Who who would that be? I don't think there's any doubt. Uh, I would say Sedano Chara. I could have guessed that. So, yep. He's a monster. So, yeah, but he's also, so this, I talked about Brad McCrimmon earlier. Brad McCrimmon was in Long Island, and I remember him calling me going, he said, say, Robs, I just watched this Daniel Chara kid. <clears throat> he just did 20 pull-ups. He's 260 pounds. Oh. <laughs> and then I ended up having to play every game against that guy for almost two, three years as a Leaf. Oh, God. Every, every shift, I was out there with this guy. And and it wasn't that he tried to kill you every shift. You just could never do anything with the guy. Like I, his feet were size fourteen, and he's you cross the blue line, he'd poke the puck away from oh, you. God. And if you went into the corner with him, <clears throat> if he touched you, you knocked you down. If you tried to touch him, you not he knocked you down. Like yeah, I thought mm-hmm. for him, for me, um, a guy that was that big but athletic and and strong and fit. But not a, like not a mean guy. Yeah, he's like not. As, as, yeah. He's as honest. He's as honest as they come. That guy, and I respect him for that in his career. But I'll tell you what: if you're if you really want to fight the guy, I, I don't wish you much luck, right? Like uh, you guys remember Brian McCabe? Like oh. Brian McCabe was a big guy. Oh my god! With me. You he remember a, that? Did they give him shit in the locker room though, Gary? Did they give McCabe <laughs> shit in the locker room after that when he wrapped? We're like. <laughs> Yeah, we're like, what are you doing? Just make just make a line change, Caver. Get off the ice. <laughs> he got picked but, up and thrown down like a tornado. Oh, Jesus. I remember that. But but unfortunately, not many – there wasn't many of his teammates coming to his age, which was That's kind right. of sad. But, that was sad. But, that was but, sad. But, but, but Sedan Achara, guys, I'd say was a guy I played against. It was honest. He didn't He didn't kill him. He didn't go out of his way to kill people. But you, you respected – uh, how much of a beast he was, and mm. for him to still be playing the same thing, right? Takes care of himself, does the right things off the ice, has found a way to play a, a very long time and have an amazing career. And so I would put him up there as a as a people a player that people could you know look at. I mean, obviously there was many tough guys and amazing uh, fitness guys that I've come across in my career, but to be able to play as long as he has uh, with that frame is pretty impressive. I'm going to ask you a question, last one, and it, it might make you a little bit uncomfortable, Gary, but listen, you played over 1,200 games. You had a full season taken away from you. You look at how you're impacting the game now in your post-career. Do you ever think about the Hockey Hall of Fame? Does that come to your mind ever? Oh, guys, if I said it didn't, I'd be lying to you. Yeah. So I'm as, I'm as honest as I come when it comes to this stuff. Uh I do think about it often. I've heard people say, "Oh, you're really close, but you just, you know, you just weren't skilled enough, or you just don't quite have the numbers. You never got your thousand points." Um, so, you know, I've heard, you know, I, I hear people call me and say, "Wow, you're not in the Hall of Fame! Like, what a joke!" And I'm like, "Hey, guys, like, I'm not the guy that makes that decision. Would it be an honor? Absolutely." Uh, but I recognize, you know, I recognize the the people that up uh, above that that that. Uh, that rule or, or vote or whatever they do. Mm-hmm. And unfortunately I just haven't, I haven't, Hey, I haven't made it yet. Uh, that doesn't, there's a lot of, but there, but I'm saying that uh, there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of players that have been great players and uh, long careers and have had challenges that aren't in either. So I'm, uh, would I be honored to, and, and, and would I like to think that I deserve to be at some point? Absolutely. Uh, am I pissed off about it? Uh, absolutely not. Right, so it is what it is. If that, that happens, I'd be I'd be absolutely thrilled to death. Uh, I'm hoping it will, uh, but at this point, I I haven't been fortunate enough to get the call yet. Well, if get, you don't go in as a player, you, you you most certainly could go in as a builder. Oh my! I God. mean, because what you're doing off the ice is great, Gary. Man, and, and listen, like like Cam said, I know you don't do a lot of these. You and I talked about that on the phone the other day. I know you don't do a lot of these. Um, 
but I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on and, and, God and sharing your story with us, man. It's 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 unbelievable, and and congrats on all your success in your post career, and keep it going. And you know what, Gary? Don't feel bad about the Hockey Hall of Fame either, because I'm I'm kind of pissed off that I haven't had the call either. So <laughs> we'll, we're in this together, Gary. We're in this together. <laughs> Cam, I want you to know I did my I did my research, and on a closing note, uh, I, I respect every player that had to do your job. And I'll be honest, uh, I have a lot of guys that had to do what you did, and uh, and whether it's Craig Bruby or Ty Domi or those guys that are great friends of mine, it's it's what you did. It's a tough gig. Um, your 14 points probably aren't going to get you in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> Son of a bitch. But <laughs> I knew you'd count them all up. <laughs> Wait a minute. He had he had that he had, had that 14. many. He had that many. God. Come I, on now. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, like 744 pims, uh, I don't know, 14 points. Gary, and, you had 2,500 penalty minutes. Gary had 14 points in one and game. you had five straight years with over 200 <laughs> penalty minutes. I mean, it's just craziness in terms of the, the, right, the, the numbers you We pumped him up enough, up, Andy. Man. Can we talk about my career? And no. My career? You, oh, that, w- that was a career? <laughs> Shut up, Al. Uh, Gary, listen. Uh, I, all right. I Cam, dominate no one. I, 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 I take that back, Cam, and just in case. <laughs> We meet in person soon. Okay, we buddy. love you, man. Hey, uh, I'm coming to Toronto. I want to. I want to. Uh, I want to get it set up. I want the nutritional. I want yeah, the nutritional Toronto. program. Anytime you guys are through Toronto, you come through Toronto. You, uh, we're more than, more than happy to have you guys over and watch and watch what we do. I'd love to share that. I share it with everybody. So, anytime, guys. I appreciate I appreciate uh, the your time today. All right. Thanks a lot, you Gary. It, You're the man, big Take boy. Care. We'll talk soon. All the best, guys. Okay. Thank you. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. That was Gary Roberts. Here on the Cam and Strick podcast, I mean, just a—I I thought it was one of the more powerful interviews we've done, man. Yeah, no, I like him, man. He's—he's—he's he's, uh, he's a real deal. He's honest. He's got a good thing going on right now, and people trust him. The guy played in the league a long, long time. He did something right. He was a leader. Played for multiple teams. He's a winner. God, that guy's a real deal. Probably should be in the hall, man. Seriously. What really s- stood out to you? Him crying, and getting emotional. Well, yeah, like. I mean, we've all had injuries. Because so it was it's an like, impressing time for him, man. I, think about your career being taken away from you in the middle of your prime. And your entire world... Think turns about upside it, down. It man. like shuts down because yeah. all your best friends, they're not around because they're all playing hockey. Not to mention you're depressed because you can't do anything. And you're probably taking painkillers. And you're just sitting in there. You can't do shit. Everybody else is having fun, doing their thing, being, you know, working on their game, mm-hmm. g- taking to the next level, and you're sitting there. And every single day that goes by, you're set back even more. Your yeah. game sets back even more. And not to mention, like, you don't know if you're going to recover from that. You can't even move your fucking neck. Mm. Like, God, no and wonder he, he could, broke down. He couldn't lift his arm. Fuck, I thought his phone fucked but up. But he was way ahead of the game. To- with working out? With working Big out time, and dude. being in shape. Innovative. And you know a guy is doing it the right way if he's playing until he's 42 or 43. You can't. <laughs> exactly, dude. You know what you, I'm saying? Although some people have a, are genetic. Like Marty. You think it's genetic. I'll tell you this. Well, if a goalie's just different, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to compare it to somebody. Marty Berdour played a long time. Was he a big workout guy? No. Absolutely not. But he was just a freak, and his body was able to move but that well. But you think goalie's? Are different, yeah. Okay. Gary Roberts got to run around, hit. You're battling goalies. You just, you, you, you're not physical. You're not. You're not playing you're through not, contact. You're not man. dumping the puck in the corner and going one on one in the corner. Those hardcore drills I told you about that the guys came and do right now because mm-hmm. of you know whatever. Um, but yeah, like he he played that long. Like he's doing something right. Your body takes a toll. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know how people do it, man. To be completely honest, you know what's you. crazy is the fact that he grew up with Joe, Joe Newendike, and I always just without knowing that, I always uh, associated the two together. Like that'd be like someone telling me right now, oh yeah, uh, Solani and Korea, they were best friends, and when they were four oh yeah, years old. I see what you're saying with that. You know what I'm saying, yeah, yeah, like the one-two like, punch. Oh well, that makes or Lemieux Yager. Yeah, they were like they grew up together. <laughs> yeah, or like, like me what? and Oshi. <laughs> no. no, no, no. Oshi and Berglund though. Oshi and Berg. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's it's very bizarre. But they could you imagine them dominating in, in in Toronto at a young young age? Who was the best player you ever played with or against? Against as a kid in Triple I'll tell you the best player. A kid named. There's two of them. Three of them. I'll give you three. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think of the kid's name. Bobby Shamount. Shamount. This this kid. He was with my agent too. Dominated AAA. This Shamount? is Mount. Tri- doesn't matter. He's irrelevant. Didn't play. Another kid. Uh, he played in Sault Ste. Marie. Not OHL. This is AAA stuff. Who was unbelievable. And I remember people talking about, you know, how good this kid was. Never made it. Played in Yale. Never made it. Number one. Ricky Nash, baby. Really? Marley's. The Marlies played against him Just in tournaments. Bigger all- than everybody. Yeah, he was big. He could skate. Long reach. I told you, Ricky, we got to get him on, by the way. 
one time I'm playing in in uh, London at the old building, and Ricky was I guess out doing some world I don't know what was some some tournament. We're we're beating them three nothing mm-hmm. going in the third period. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden he shows up, gets dressed, scores four in a row, beats us four to three. Sit down, son. Really? Fuck! Right off the plane, gets dressed, scores four. See ya. Oh, and what were you doing? See ya. I was kicked out of the game. Minus, I think at that point. minus four. Oh, I probably had a goal in Dash fifteen four. penalty minutes. <laughs> but yeah, that just shows how much I just dominated. But, you know, that's the thing. Just you know, being in that environment. Stuff. I've seen all these kids: William Nylander, uh, Connor McDavid. Like all these kids, you see them when they're like teenagers, fourteen, fifteen, Yeah, but 15, they're pumped 16. up. They're, they're like college athletes. They are. They're like college athletes. Well, how they're long? So pumped McDavid's up. been working out with Gary Roberts since he was a teenager, dude. So like we talk about, even like in Toronto, like you are. You're put on a pedestal before you even do shit. Yeah, so you're kind of like sometimes in high school here a little bit with football and things like that, oh, where you're just you're fucking do- you're so dominant and like you're treated like royalty, and all of a sudden you get to the show and you don't even know how to work out because you never had to. Right. So I don't. But these guys did both. Some guys can't f- can't figure it out because everybody's good now. So you dominate at a young age. And you're the best. You're the best. You're the best. Well, you didn't even fucking make it. Mm-hmm. You didn't even make it because you didn't you didn't know how and to see, take your game. People to the next should level. listen to that. I mean, just because you're you, great doesn't mean at 13 shit. Thirteen years old doesn't mean shit. Everybody's great at thirteen. Any good player that plays in the NHL is good at thirteen. And you know what the difference is? I remember, uh, like, just to you know bring it you know back like a personal story for example, like Matthew Kachuk and like Logan Brown and some of these guys. When they were drafted in the first round, like right away, they were like, "Yeah, my dad told me like it doesn't mean anything." Doesn't mean anything, you know. And I think some kids who don't have the same resources around them, like they celebrate as if this is automatic, it's guaranteed. You're going to go on to play a thousand games in the National Hockey League, let alone a hundred games. No, uh, no, no doubt about that, man. How many guys have gotten drafted and even signed? Big ticket guys I played against in juniors that signed big contracts mm-hmm. and they didn't do shit. Because it takes you, you have to find, I don't care how good you are, unless you're Crosby, but those guys are all working too. Yeah. They're all working too. So you have to know that everybody's good now. And you're playing against guys that are, some are good, some aren't good. Now everybody's fucking good, and they're working out. You got to stay hungry. There it is, man. I remember talking to a group of parents one time, and I said, listen, like, they were ban a major at the time. And, That's a beer. And, and they're, is that what that was? It's not Kool-Aid. <laughs> They got mad at me because I said, listen, there may be like 1% of the kids in our team that are actually, that will mo- go on to play like maybe Division One. Okay. Maybe. Now, things have changed a little bit. I mean, we get a handful of kids from most of our teams if you're, if you're truly developing them the right but way. But these kids now that, are working that out, should doing their shit. be able to play some, some level of college hockey, right? But Andy, I'll tell you this right now. They don't want to believe it. And you know what? Going back and looking at the team photo. There's like two kids that went on to play. We got two. We got one kid in the show, actually, who in Dakota Murmurs. Oh yeah, but he was playing on the. He was playing on a different team, the competing team. Yeah, yeah. Chase Berger, who's playing in the American League right now. Yeah, I know Chase. He wasn't on our team. He was on the same team as Dakota, even though we beat that team, by the way. Don't care. But on our team, we didn't have a single kid that went on to play Division One hockey. But that's normal. Andy. I know. I know. So parents, but they, they remember that. Believe parents, it. They, they think it's automatic. Like yeah, it's guaranteed. Because they're dumb. They don't, they don't get it. Because their kid's a, a stud at 14. It just doesn't matter. You're playing against 14-year-old kids. Man, I swear to God, even when I started working out, I, we no one worked out in AAA you know, when we're that age, 12, 13, 14. But once I hit like 14, 15, I, I remember my dad's like, you got you to gotta call Rick Wilson. who's mm-hmm. four, and, he, and, and I was the first one to really start like working out in, with all the players in St. Louis that, that, that my dad had to – was broke at the time, but still paid Rick. Rick took care of him here and there when we couldn't do it one who, month. Who turned you guys on to Rick? My dad. No, but who told But him? I knew Rick. Rick, I was friends with Brock Wilson, okay. Rick's son, and yeah. we went to school together, and we so played AAA how, together. And then Rick would always come yeah. out like, and I need and Cam. Jordy, Jordy Fox, obviously. Jordy he's, Fox, too. And then so, yeah. and so my dad's like, I'm calling Rick today. I'm like, you need to get in the gym. You yeah. need to separate yourself. Yeah. You're fucking from Eureka. You need to figure something That's out. That's where I started working out, too. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Get that neck going, baby. You know that's true. Get that neck All right. going. I know you did. Um, anyway, hope you enjoy Gary Roberts, man. Yeah. We we really appreciate people like him. We, we, we Listen, we respect all our guests, but people like him who don't do a lot of these yeah, and to share his story when he doesn't Pretty typically cool. do that and to see how emotional it was for him, we respect him big time. Thanks a lot, Gary. We appreciate you coming on the Camus. And one, one thing, and we're going to – guys, look – 
the reason why this engine's going is because of our sponsors. Mm-hmm. And I hate to like, but I'm telling you, like, take care. If you if you need if you're thinking about your your phone or your your car or anything like that, if you're in St. Louis and you need a car, go to Bellman. Like, it helps us out so much. It keeps this engine driving. Like, it's it's not like we're just sitting here. This is our livelihood. And subscribe, subscribe to press that button. I mean, it just helps. It just helps. And tell your friends. Yeah, tell your friends. Like Unless you have like already, Andy, you don't we, have any. We appreciate that, man. I mean, honestly, it's going great. Yes. Uh, CarShield.com. Give them a call. Yep. Today. It's, and again, yeah, they they're they're awesome. They, honestly, like it's like it's such a simple thing. It on it just it just simplifies your life, and that's what we need, especially these days, man. It yeah. honestly does. No, there's no doubt about it. So you get yourself caught in a jam. You never know when that's going to happen, but it can happen very quick. 800-857-2481. Use that promo code CAM. Save yourself 10%. Also, GadgetBuyback.com. You got a piece of crap phone that's broken. Turn it in and get yourself an upgrade. You need it. You do need it. Again, GadgetBuyback.com. 877-772-8880. And, of course, as Cam just mentioned, Dan Bellman with Bellman.com. Get yourself a new ride. For the summer. No swinging dicks. And our girl. Oh, girl. Renee what Howitt. up? What up? What oh, up, girl, Renee? We love up? you, Renee. Oh, girl. What's up? Cope24.com. Changing our parenting experience. Again, C O P E 24. Wonderful woman. Dot com. You want to see what a good person is? Oh, my who God. Who are doing great things for a lot of Helping people? kids. God, man. She's awesome. That's what she's doing. Support them, please. Thank Cope you, guys. Cope24.com. All right. This has been episode number 48. Love y'all. With Gary Roberts. See ya.